1984, the government of General Muhammad Buhari attempted to kidnap and bring former transport minister Omar Udiko from London to face charges of corruption in Nigeria. The covert operation was carried out in collaboration with Mossad, the Israeli Institute for Intelligence and Special Tax. In this video, we re-examine the entire Diko affair, covering intelligence gathering, logistics planning, the actual operation and the diplomatic crisis that arose. This is a very detailed video that you wouldn't want to miss. Please stay tuned. Welcome to Hispel Media In-Depth History. Alhaji Umaru Abdul Rahman Diko was born on December 31, 1936 in a small village of Wamba. After attending his elementary education in Zaria, Umaru Diko obtained a Bachelor of Science degree from the University of London. Before venturing into politics, Diko worked for the BBC Hausa service. In the 1960s and as a promising young politician, Diko was instrumental in mobilizing northern opinion leaders against the military government of General Agui Ronsi. During the regime of General Yakub Ugoon, he served as a commissioner for finance and later as commissioner for information in the North Central State. In 1979, Diko contested for Senate of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, but the bid was unsuccessful. By the time democratic rule was restored by the Obasanjo military regime in 1979, Diko had now matured into a very cunning politician. He would then be appointed as transport minister by President Shehu Shagari. And by the time the administration of Shehu Shagari came to an end in 1983, his name had become synonymous with corruption in Nigeria. Omaru Diko was considered by the general public as a face of corruption and shady deals in the 1980s. Stories of his alleged involvement in corruption are mind-blowing. In addition to his role as transport minister, Diko headed the controversial presidential tax force that was set up to alleviate food shortages by distributing imported rice. More like the hoarding of palliatives during COVID-19 in 2020, Diko's presidential tax force was accused of hoarding rice in order to aggravate food shortages and cause artificial increase in the price of food stuff. The committee was also accused of issuing import licenses to businessmen with connection to the ruling party, the NPN. Humaru Diko considers himself untouchable because he was married to the relative of the president. He was involved in many other controversies as well. For instance, at the time of high inflation, scarce commodities, falling oil prices, and general hardship faced by the people, Diko remarked that things were not too bad since all Nigerians were not yet eating from dustbin. Umaru Diko made himself unpopular not just among his party members and the general public, but also with top military officers. He ordered covert surveillance on top military officers as well. This was a dangerous game to play since the top echelon of the military were highly politicized and was full of officers with significant coup plotting or military regime experience. Among the officers he had clashed with was the General Officer Commanding 3rd Armored Division, JOS, Major General Muhammadu Buhari. Well, Buhari was aware of this and complained to President Shehu Shagari that Diko had ordered his movement to be monitored. But when Shagari confronted Diko, he did not deny this claim but simply said that Buhari cannot be trusted and should be retired. Would you say Diko was right after all? Buhari later overthrew Shehu Shagari's government. Umaru Diko also engaged in other actions that put him at odds with the military. According to Mustafa Jokolo, a military officer who later became the Emir of Gwandu, Diko closed all jetties that were being used by military officers for smuggling. One of the closed jetties was said to belong to former Chief of Army Staff, Lieutenant General T.Y. Danjuma. On the 1st of January 1984, Major General Muhammad Ubuari announced in his first broadcast that his government would ensure that corrupt officials and their agents would be brought to book. 
This, together with Diko's previous problems with military leaders, makes him a prime target for the new regime. Soon after the coup, armed troops went hunting for him and ransacked his official residence in the Koyi area of Lagos. But Diko had escaped. With the help of friends and a sizable amount of cash, Diko drove to Nigeria's border with the Republic of Benin. He bribed his way across the border and continued to Togo's capital Lome, where he boarded a KLM aircraft to London via Amsterdam. While in exile, Omaru Diko joined a host of other notable Nigerian fugitives from justice in London. As the federal military government continued to detain, try and imprison deposed politicians for massive corruption, London became a safe haven for others. Diko became an outspoken critic of the new military regime in Nigeria, waging constant verbal attack on the government. He was making a bad situation worse and the determination to bring him back to face justice became very high. In 1973, Nigeria caught diplomatic relations with Israel through the instigation of the Organization of African Unity OAU. However, Nigeria and Israel conducted business deals out of public view. Nigeria supplied more than 50% of Israel's crude oil in exchange for military hardware. Israeli Prime Minister Yishak Shamir was concerned that a new regime in Nigeria might interrupt the flow of oil from the country. They were desperate to find favor in the sight of the regime. This could have been responsible for why they got involved in the Diko affair. With Diko still at large, Israel offered to track him down using the formidable resources of Mossad. Mossad is the Israeli Institute for Intelligence and Special Attacks, formed on December 13, 1949. However, other sources claim that although oil was a factor, the new regime solicited the services of Mossad through a network of contact with Israeli security establishment and businessmen in Nigeria. However, according to Major Mustafa Haruna Jokolo, retired, the Israeli involvement in Diko's kidnapping was obtained through Lieutenant General T. Y. Danjuma. The pursuit and capture of Diko was a typical Mossad operation. It was fast, surgical, and precise. But the entire operation was planned by the Office of the Head of State in collaboration with the National Security Organization NSO, and Israelis. Alexander Barak was a 27-year-old from the Israeli coastal town of Netanya who worked as a photographer for the Israeli intelligence corps. In an interview with Israeli newspaper Yediot Aronov in 1995, Barak claimed that he and Cohen met in New York to finalize the plan with a man named Rafi, who was close to the ruling circles in Nigeria. So, who was Rafi? Alhaji Lawal Rafin Dadi was the director general of Nigeria's NSO, and Buari had a close relationship with him. Dr. Levi Arie Shapiro, a 43 year old Russian born Israeli national, was a consultant and director of the intensive care unit at Tel Aviv's Hashiron Hospital and an Israeli Army Reserve Major. He was brought into the plot by Barak, who gave him money to buy anesthetics to be used to stupefy Diku. They were the key actors of the plot. It takes moons of intelligence gathering, surveillance and a great deal of courage to carry out the operation. Mossad used its vast network of synonyms to its advantage. The synonyms are known Israeli Jews living outside of Israel and work with Mossad. In order to work for Mossad, a synonym must be 100% Jewish. Their local and professional contacts help them to assist Mossad with covert operations and to bypass red tapes. Synonyms across Europe were put on red alert. They memorized his image and physical description. Doctors were told to be vigilant in case he came in for plastic surgery. Tellers were given his measurements and shoemakers were given his shoe size. Lookouts were posted at his favorite hotels, car rental companies and airports. It was indeed a well-organized covert operation. 
they had tried to lure him to Paris for interview with CBS network, but he became suspicious and refused to be interviewed. Major Muhammad Amadou Jaffa Yusufu, a 40-year-old father of seven, was a former army officer. In May 1984, after the military coup that deposed Shagari, he was transferred to the Nigerian Ministry of External Affairs and posted to Nigeria's High Commission in the United Kingdom. Despite the fact that Yusufu arrived in the United Kingdom on a diplomatic passport, the Foreign and Commonwealth Office was not informed that he was a member of the Nigerian diplomatic mission. He was clearly planted for the purpose of participating in the DECO operation. Then, the search for DECO was narrowed down to West London. On the 30th of June 1984, a Mossad agent spotted a man who fits Dico's description in London's wealthy base water district. He followed him on foot to a house on number 49, Porchester Terrace. The agent spied on the house for several days and noted his routine and movement. Felix Masoud Abitol, a 31-year-old Israeli national of Tunisian origin, came into London on July 2, 1984 and checked into the Roussel Square Hotel. Meanwhile, Major Yusufu had already hired a van that would convey Biko after he was captured. On July 4, 1984, an empty Nigerian Boeing 707 cargo airliner flew from Lagos to Stansted Airport in Essex, United Kingdom. The Nigerian High Commission in London informed the UK authorities that the airport had arrived to collect diplomatic baggage. Several Nigerian security officers were on board but were not allowed to leave the airport. The jet had parked near a cargo area out of sight of the passenger terminal. Then, on July 5th, that is, the next day, Major Yusufu drove his van from Notting Hill Gate in West London to Dico's house on Porchester Terrace. Shapiro, Barak, and Abitur were in the van with Yusufu. Meanwhile, back at Stansted Airport, the pilot of the Nigerian Airways plane submitted a departure time of 3 p.m. and claimed that the plane would be carrying documentation for the Nigerian Ministry of External Affairs on a trip back to Nigeria. This documentation claimed diplomatic immunity. Then, at Porchester Terrace, shortly after midday, Dico emerged from his house at 49 Porchester Terrace for an interview with Ghanaian journalist named Elizabeth Akwa Ohene. As Dico walked down the road, two men burst out from the yellow van parked outside his house, grabbed him and forced him into the back of the van. Within seconds, the van doors had closed and the van sped away at breakneck speed. It was a typical Mossad operation. After traversing London's busy street, the van eventually came to a halt. Vico was initially relieved, believing that his kidnappers had been stopped by the police. But he was wrong. They had just stopped to refoil the van. Vico was told to remain silent while his captors refoiled. He would be transferred to a waiting lorry at a pre-planned location near Regent's Park Zoo. And then, immediately, Shapiro went to work and injected Dico with a potent respiratory depressant in the arm and buttocks to induce unconsciousness. Dico eventually fell unconscious. There was, however, a problem. Dico's secretary, Elizabeth Hayes, had watched through the window as Dico was being bundled into the van. The shocked secretary immediately dialed 999 the United Kingdom's emergency service number and notify authorities of the incidents she had just watched. The call was quickly escalated and within minutes, William Hacklesby, commander of Scotland Yard's anti-terrorism squad, was alerted and the British Prime Minister, Margaret Thatcher, was also informed. And within the next few minutes, the scene was cordoned off by police. All custom officials at airport, seaport, and border crossings were told to be extra vigilant with regards to Nigerian-bound vessels. By mid-afternoon on July 5, 1984, 
Shapiro had anesthetized Diko into unconsciousness and locked him in a crate. However, there was no trace of Diko, Shapiro, Abitol, or Barak at Stansted Airport. Instead, two containers were transported to the airport by white vehicle at about 4 p.m. The vehicle was escorted by two black Mercedes-Benz cars bearing Nigerian diplomatic license plates. A forklift truck unloaded the two crates labeled diplomatic baggage and addressed to the Nigerian Ministry of External Affairs in Lagos from the lorry and placed them in the custom shed to await loading onto the plane. The crates were 1.2 meters in height, 1.2 meters in depth and 1.5 meters in width. They were joined by Major Yusufu and Okon Edeth, a member of the Nigerian High Commission in London. Customs officers were highly inquisitive and vigilant after being warned by security forces to be wary. Charles Moreau, a custom officer, observed an unusual medical smell and noise coming from one of the crates. Although the Boeing 707 was still a few minutes away from takeoff, Moreau took advantage of the opportunity to inspect the containers. Moreau insisted on the careful investigation of the packages under the guise that they lacked the proper official seal or diplomatic document. Moreau called the police and asked the handling agents not to load the crates onto the plane. This was the beginning of the failure of this operation. While customs inspectors waited for the police, the crates were held down and sealed. When police arrived, they surrounded the Boeing 707 on the airfield, while other policemen went to the cargo shed to open the crate. The Nigerian diplomatic personnel accompanying the containers were instructed to watch as the crate were being opened. Major Yusufu screamed angrily that the packages were not searchable because they were protected by diplomatic immunity. But his furious protests were ignored and police used a crowbar to unlock the crate. What they discovered on the inside was shocking. Diko was bound and unconscious in the first crate. His torso was bay. An endotracheal tube was inserted into his throat to prevent him from choking on his own vomit. His kidnappers wanted to bring him to Nigeria alive. Shapiro was beside him, holding syringes and a supply of extra anesthetics to administer to Diko where necessary. The plot had just been laid bare and exposed. Then Shapiro asked the custom officers, Well, gentlemen, what do we do now? But that was not all. Inside the second crate were Abitol and Barak. The unconscious Diko was rushed to Harford Share and Essex Hospital in Bishop's Stant Stortford. After staying unconscious for 36 hours, he regained consciousness around 12 noon the next day. He was completely unaware of the preceding drama and his dramatic rescue and was treated at the hospital under heavy police security. While the Nigerian government denied any involvement in the kidnap attempt, the British government threatened to deport any Nigerian diplomat who is found to be involved. Nigeria's High Commissioner in London, Major General Haladu Anthony Anania, claimed the incident was the work of some patriotic friends of Nigeria. The Nigerian Airways 707 plane was detained by the police and about 17 people arrested on suspicion of complicity in the kidnap. In retaliation to this, the Nigerian government detained a British Caledonian Boeing 747 plane that had taken off from Lagos but was ordered back for security reasons. The British plane would then be released after Britain had released Nigeria's own Boeing airplane. The absence of the correct diplomatic document became the catalyst for the plot's failure. Alexander Barak subsequently blamed Bamfa for the failure as Bamfa did not provide the correct diplomatic document to accompany the crate. Out of the original 17 suspects that were arrested, four were tried and convicted and was given violent prison sentences. Alexander Barak was given 14 years in jail but served eight and a half years. Mohamed Yusufu was handed 12 years in prison but served 
seven years. Levi Are Shapiro and Felix Abitol were handed 10 years imprisonment each, but each served for six years each. After the incidents, diplomatic relations between Nigeria and Britain were suspended for two years and was only renewed during the Babangida era. Diko remained in London for the next 11 years and returned to Nigeria on the invitation of General Sanya Bacha in 1995. In 2001, Diko petitioned Opushta Pandel accusing Bernard Bamfa, Al Haji Lawal Rafin Dadi, Major General Haladu Hanania, and Lieutenant General T.Y. Danjuma has been responsible for his kidnapping. He died on July 1, 2014, at the age of 77. The Umaru Diko affair remains Nigeria's biggest diplomatic blunder to this day. Click this video here for a full story of the assassination of Deligiwa using a sophisticated letter bomb. For more interesting history stories like this one, please like this video and remember to subscribe to Hispo Media and on the bell notification as well. And I will see you in the next video. Thank you very much for watching. Peace.